Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Lord, be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best, Lord, by day or by night. Waking Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou Be thou my battle shield, sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shalt thou my high tower. Reaches I heed not, no man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. I keep. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. So here we are already on the third Sunday of Advent. And we have lit already, as, you've, or as you will be seeing, we are going to light the candle of reverence. The way God reverences us, in other words, the respect and admiration He has for His own creation, and how we are called to revere Him, especially in the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us have the lighting of the Advent candle. The third Sunday of Advent, reverence. As we revere in your love, Lord, remembering the sacrifice of your Son, let us rejoice and respect the lives of all your people.
as we light this third candle, we thank you, dear Lord, for the gift of life and hold you in reverence. May we always place you first in our lives, knowing that you are the way and through, your all, through you all things are possible. Amen. As always, when we come before God, knowing that we haven't always been so reverent in our dealings in this past week, let's ask God to forgive our faults and our failings as we say, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, blessed Mer ever Virgin Mary, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O oh God, who see how your people faithfully await the feast of the Lord's Nativity, enable us, we pray, to attain the joys of so great a salvation and to celebrate them always with solemn worship and glad rejoicing. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our readings are beautiful today. Talking about joy. Not so much pleasure, but joy. How are we going to be joyful, says Paul in the Thessalonians, he tells us. What about the joy of John the Baptist? Today, we focus on the joy that Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, the promise of Jesus Christ, gives us. Let's listen to these readings. Enjoy. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. The word of the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. My soul shall exult in my God. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. My soul shall exult in my God. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel, 
in remembrance of his mercy. My soul shall exult in my God. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brethren, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophesying. But test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the Lord of peace himself sanctify you wholly. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The Word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to preach the good news to the poor. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light and that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. They said to him then, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the path of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one, whom you do not know, even he who comes after me, the throng of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Joy and pleasure. What's the difference? Joy and pleasure. Our scriptures talk to us about joy. Right from Isaiah, we have this very first reading saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. And here he is talking to people who are going through a tough time. Joy. He's not talking about pleasure. He's not talking about, oh, it's really pleasant to be in COVID with the prospect of the beaches being closed and the economy being affected again. He's not talking about the pleasure of a Christmas dinner with the whole family together. No, he's talking about joy. 
There's a difference, I believe, between joy and pleasure. Let's have a little look at what may be this difference. And remember, we are talking in the context of reverence. Remember that reverence means to admire and to respect. And as we reflect on reverence, we remember that God has great reverence for us. Why? Because we are his own creation. So he respects us and he admires us. Not because of everything we do, but because of everything that he has given us. And he is calling us to admire and respect. And we're going to see this in John's life. We are called to revere God. And to have this incredible joy in doing so. Psalm says, my soul shall exult in my God. Joyful once again. But let's have a look at our second reading. Our second reading is so, so strong. A reading to the Thessalonians. And remember, these are people who Paul had visited and they had grown up. And this is the last chapter of the first letter to the Thessalonians where he's encouraging them. And he says to them, be happy at all times. Now remember, they are being harassed. It's not a pleasant life. But he's saying to them, be happy. Be joyful. Rejoice always. How do we do this joyful? And what is the difference between joy and pleasant? Well, I'd like to offer an explanation the way I see it. To be joyful is more of a spiritual value. Pleasure is more of a physical reward. So, to have pleasure, I have pleasure when I walk along the beachfront. I have pleasure when I swim in the sea. I have pleasure when I'm drinking a glass of wonderful wine. I have pleasure when I see how people are serving one another in the, in the parish. I get pleasure because of something that is impinging on me. But it, all these pleasures are, give temporary satisfaction. In a sense, it's a gift to ourselves. That's why we have partying and drinking and nice clothes. The rage happened because people wanted to have pleasure. But joy, I believe, can be seen as something more spiritual. It has a deeper satisfaction. And it is, can be seen as a gift from God. Something that is beyond what I can do for myself. That deep sense of joy, even when there's chaos, as in the case of John the Baptist. But there is a joy. As in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, rejoice, not because everything is pleasant. No, we have joy because there's a deeper value everything that happens in our lives. And Paul talks us about this deep joy. He says, yes, pray. When we pray and have a consolation in our prayer life, there's a deep sense of joy. It's not always pleasant, but joy. In serving one another, we get that sense of giving and we feel that we are helping. And there's a deep sense of joy. It might not be pleasant to help people who are starving, but there's a sense of God-given joy that we have the opportunity to serve and save a life. Paul also talks about, in Thessalonians, about holiness. 
There are many things that we can do that do not make us feel holy. They may be pleasant things, but do we receive real joy in them? Let us look at this great reverence that John has in our gospel. And remember, as we're talking about reverence, we're talking about respect and admiration. So when we are being revered by God, in other words, he is experiencing extreme joy because he sees in us his own likeness. And when we are called to revere each other, to do things not because it feels good, because it's pleasant, but because it is a divine vocation, and we have that deep spiritual joy, then we show reverence for one another. So let's look at this gospel in a slightly different way. As we read the word John, let us put our own name. So I'm going to read this gospel again, and I'm going to reflect for you how I, in my situation as a priest in Belito, try and put myself into the shoes of John by way of feeling the reverence of God and giving that reverence to others so that I can live a joyful life. So you do it for yourselves, and I'll just give you an example of how I'm trying to do it in my life. So the way we can do it is this. We read the gospel again, and then we change the name to your own name. So, in the gospel it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So now we change it, and you change it for yourself. There was a man or woman or child sent from God whose name was Stephen. This is me I'm going to be talking about. But you put your own name, John, Mary, Jane, whoever. He came, John came for testimony. Stephen came to bring good news and hope and joy where there is darkness. I am not the light. I am not Jesus. I've only come as a human being to bear witness to this light of Jesus. This is my testimony. Many people have come and asked me, who are you? Every time somebody introduces me or I introduce myself, the question arises, who are you? And I make it quite clear that I am not Jesus Christ. I am not one of the prophets from the Old Testament. Just like John, I'm none of those people. And as many questions as they might ask of me, I must be certain that I answer them correctly. So if they say, are you a doctor? I will say, no. Are you a healer? I will say, no. You, we go through the list, and that's okay. Why? Because I know, as much as I can, at this moment, I believe what God wants me to be. It is the same for you all. And they ask the question three times, who are you? Who are you? What do you say about yourself? And then John says, I am a voice. That's all he says. I am a voice. And I need to ask myself, what am I? What is my divine vocation in being revered by God and revering others and the thing that will give me the spiritual joy? Not something that's going to give me pleasure in life. That might come from time to time, but joy will remain. What am I called? And this is not an easy question. 
but it can also change from day to day. But for day, I, today I would say, I am a priest in Belito at the time of a terrible pandemic. In fact, a time when I myself am worried about the second wave. But I am called to preach the good news, to preach of hope and love and indeed joy because Jesus Christ has been born and this single human being came to earth showing himself to be the physical face of God, to be the visible face of an invisible God, so that as I witness to that joy as a human being in my good and my bad days, sickness and health, that other people will learn how to follow Jesus on their own path. That's what I feel my vocation is about. I am not Jesus. I am not a prophet. I am a priest in Belito in this particular time, and I must focus on trying to preach a word of hope to the people I'm called to revere, to explain to you why I believe in the joy that Jesus Christ gives us. And yes, people will go on to say, as they did with John the Baptist, they say, but you baptize with water. So people will say, but you are a Catholic priest. You could do all those things without being a Catholic priest. Well, John says, yes, that's fine, yes. I'm baptizing with water, but it's more important to know that we are serving God who is amongst us. So whether I'm a Catholic priest or not, whether I'm baptizing with water only or not, does not matter. What matters is that what I'm doing is because of the joy of knowing and following Jesus Christ. I do it as a Catholic. Other people do it as, as um, Anglicans or, or, or um, I don't know, all kind, I can't even think at the moment. What is specific is that we are focused on Jesus. We are focused on the incredible love that Jesus Christ has. And of course, as John was doing it with water, I'm doing it as a Catholic priest. Why? Because this gives me the greatest joy in my life. It's where I believe God has called me to be. This is where I can put myself in this gospel, in the context of my day to day. And as we continue to go into the Eucharist, this Eucharist is so precious to us Catholics. Why? Because we've been brought up in a tradition that has shown us something that is so incredibly beautiful. This Christmas is not going to be like other Christmases. How are we going to be the John the Baptist? How are you as mothers and fathers, children, cousins, uncles, going to celebrate Christmas? And how are you going to do it by revering the people that you love, the people that you are called to serve? It's going to be very different. This year we are called to keep our distance, to be very, very careful. Look at how the pleasures of the youth have led us into a very, very serious situation with the rages. I'm even hearing now that there are parishes that are very scared to be open during Christmas. A parish priest from the parish said there are 50 people who are COVID positive in his parish. We in Belito are a hot spot. It's on the news. How do we have joy? How do we have reverence in a time like this? Well, it's only because we believe in Jesus Christ. And our joy does not come from 
having pleasant experiences. It comes from knowing the truth of the presence of Jesus in our lives. That's how John the Baptist lived. He respected the message of God. He admired God. When he saw Jesus, he had great reverence, respect, admiration. And so he was quite comfortable doing his baptism with water. Yes, it got him into trouble, but he died with the spiritual joy of knowing that his life was fulfilled. It wasn't pleasant, I should imagine, having his head chopped off. But he seemed to have the spiritual joy of knowing that what he was doing was for humanity. Just as John the Baptist. This Christmas, it has be those unique people. Who are you? Who do people see you to be? But more especially, especially what has God called each one of us to be this Christmas? What kind of joy are we going to promote this Christmas? Amen. Knowing the spiritual truth, as John the Baptist did, gave him great certitude and joy. So when we know the truth and we are living the truth as our creed explains it to us, making this part of our fundamental understanding of life, this will help us to have the deep spiritual joy of knowing Jesus Christ. As we say together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became a man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing that you revere us in that we are your own creation and we are called to revere you, our creator, and to revere one another with great joy. To you now, we lift up our prayers and petitions. For the Holy Church of God and all who minister in it, that they will show the joy of Christ's love to all people. Lord, hear us. That we will all hear the lonely voice of John the Baptist, calling us to repentance and sincere sorrow for our sins. Lord, hear us. We pray 
that we may always find time for Christ in our lives, and so we may be ready to welcome him with true Christian joy. Lord, hear us. For those who are overburdened with life, the lonely and the sick, that the joy of Advent may shine in their lives. Lord, hear us. That those who have died may experience a true and lasting happiness with God in heaven. Lord, hear us. We ask that our farmers are protected and kept safe from harm. Lord, hear us. We pray for our parish, our village, our country in this time of pandemic, as well as the entire world and all our family and friends and those we don't even know. We ask you, Lord, to guide us to have the spiritual joy of doing what needs to be done in this season so that we, Lord, can give you all the thanks as you heal us and guide us. Lord, hear us. We thank you, Lord, for hearing all these prayers that are deep within our hearts. May we continue to strive to have spiritual joy rather than earthly pleasures. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus, you are Lord, you are risen from the dead, and you are Lord. Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus, you are Lord. You are the way I am the way No one knows the Father But it be through me I am in my Father And my Father is in me And we come in love to live within your heart Jesus, you are Lord You are risen from the dead And you are Lord Every knee shall bow And every tongue confess that Jesus, you are Lord, you are the way. I am the truth, and I set my spirit deep within your hearts, and you will know. truth I give to you will set you free. Jesus, you are Lord. You are risen from the dead and you are Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus, you are Lord, you are the way. I am the life, the living waters are pour out for you. 
Anyone who drinks of the waters that I give will have eternal life. Jesus, you are Lord. You are risen from the dead and you are Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus, you are Lord. You are the way that Jesus, you are Lord. You Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be made acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all his holy church. May the sacrifice of our worship, Lord, we pray, be offered to you unceasingly to complete what was begun in sacred mystery and powerfully accomplish for us your saving work through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For all the oracles of the prophets foretold him, the Virgin Mother longed for him, with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist sung of his coming and proclaimed his presence when he came. It is by his gift that already we rejoice at the mystery of his nativity, so that he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in his praise. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Doesn't that give us a sense of joy? That we are singing this with all the angels in heaven. Not pleasure, but joy. As we go into this Eucharist, let us see the great reverence that God has for us in sending us the Son, and the Son's great reverence in giving us his body and blood, and how we are called to have the same attitude towards God and one another. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dew falls so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, giving thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, once more giving thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which we poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church, spread throughout the world, bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Wilfred and Abel, our bishops, and all the clergy. Remember also all our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with her spouse, Saint Joseph, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Our first week we were called to show care. Last week we were called to assist one another. This week we are called to reverence each other because God dwells within each one that we see. Let's pray for all humanity in this time of the pandemic. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Offer one another a sign of peace. If you are alone, then offer it to the world and to those that you know and love, and even to the strangers that you will meet. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
as you prepare yourselves at home for the spiritual communion. Think of the great joy Jesus has right now as you sit there reverently desiring the Eucharist and longing for the day when you too will receive it with us in community. And knowing that as we are trusted and respected and admired to receive this gift, we are called to give it by way of reverencing one another with great joy, knowing that each of us, like John, have a particular part to play in preaching the good news to those we encounter. Say to the faint of heart, be strong and do not fear. Behold, our God will come and he will save us. Let us pray. We implore your mercy, Lord, that this divine sustenance may cleanse us of our faults, prepare us for the coming feasts through Christ our Lord. Amen. So, a few announcements. Please remember, week three is now out for you to either download from your um, computers or you can see it on Facebook. Also, please remember, those of you who haven't come for confession, please come along and bring with you your angel, okay? And there are also the angel cards and the examination of conscience, which is really a different form of meditating on what we need to bring before God. And we bring these with us, and we can light this in the fire to burn it as a sign that our sins are forgiven and gone, and the priest will bless our angels, because when we come to confession and our sins are forgiven, we are as pure as angels. That's the truth. So, let's have great fun this, this uh, Christmas season. Remember, the children, there are some rocks in the garden for you to come and collect whenever you're around, and with the word care, that's the theme that's our Advent theme, to care. In other words, to care, to assist, revere, and engage. As you've heard on the news that we are a hotspot here in Belito, and things are becoming serious once again, so please be very careful with your social distancing, your masks, and your hand sanitizing. And that's the way we revere others, by respecting these rules and regulations. Please remember to book for your masses, not only for penitential services, um, which is in your bulletin, the dates and times. It will be this Thursday evening between 6 and 8, and next Saturday between, I think it's 3 and 5. So please come along and confess. But Christmas Eve, that's the 24th, the 5 o'clock, 5.30 mass is already full. And the 9 o'clock Mass still has a few places. The 8 a.m. Mass on Christmas Day is already full, but you can book for the 10.30 Mass. That's an additional Mass to help us in these pandemic times. So please make your bookings because we have to give allowances also for the holiday makers who will be coming down. It's a very difficult time for us to coordinate all of this, but we're doing our best. You've heard me ask many, many times, we are still in need of people to join the COVID teams. It's not a difficult job, but we do need you. We might have to even cancel one of the masses that we have planned because we don't have people. People are being asked, 
Some people who've been working hard all year are now going away, and that is good for them. But we need to make sure we can open our masses for all our celebrations. So please get on board, follow your heart, and let's be this community of love, not only for ourselves, but for our visitors. Great. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's now go in love and peace to serve the Lord. On the 11th of uh, December this year, I will have celebrated 39 years of the ordination to the priesthood. Now the time has flown. I can't believe how quickly it has gone. My mind goes back to that very exciting first year when I worked at Oakford Priory with Father Jerry O'Hara, and then a year down the south coast at uh, Port Chipston and Margate. Then I was working for a short spell at Hamsdale, before going back to the north coast where I worked at Stanger for about 13 years. And then after that I came to Hillcrest Parish and believe it or not I was here for 20 years. When I think about those happy years I realise how much love and care I received from, from parishioners, from the various people that I worked with, the um, provision of a house for me to live in, a car of course, uh, food naturally, uh, something to spend on holidays, the medical aid, all those things were given to us um, so freely by parishioners. And then comes retirement. Well, we often are quite surprised to think that priests retire, but, but we do of course, but only in the sense that we are no longer in charge of a parish. We continue being occupied, uh, celebrating Holy Mass wherever we can, particularly when priests are um, on holiday or ill. We get confessions, we go and visit the sick. We do all the things that one normally does as a priest, but without the responsibility of looking after a parish. Naturally, this of course raises a lot of questions about um, who looks after us because when the parishes are, when we're working in a parish, we are taken care of very adequately by the parishes. And this is where the, the archdiocese comes in. Just as um, for the training, there's five or six or seven years that the young man has to undergo in training at the seminary, so the older priest has to be taken care of, and that responsibility falls now on the, on the diocese rather than on the parish. Nevertheless, it is ordinary parishioners who have to go out beyond themselves and the care of their own parishes to, to think about the training of priests and the care for elderly priests. So it is the contributions made to the Advent Appeal which works very well for this. Um, it provides the, the bishops throughout the country to have the funds to uh, train young priests, sometimes up to eight years, and to care for the retired priests, to make sure that we have a home to live in, uh, medical aid, of course, is very essential, something to eat and something to drink, and a little bit of money to go on holiday to, or to uh, buy the necessities of life. So I'd like to take this opportunity, uh, first of all, to thank parishes over the years who have cared for me personally and for other priests in the times that we worked in parishes, but now to thank once again everybody for their participation in the Advent Appeal and caring for the future, for the young priests who are going to be trained, and now for caring for the priests who have reached the, the end of their lives as well, but we still hope to be useful and helpful towards the Church. So I'd like to thank you very much for that and ask you to uh, be very generous in your support of the Advent Appeal. Thank you and God bless you.
Nee.